okay so uh, i think we can start now so uh, let me uh, introduce our guest speaker so so next we have professor srinivasan parthasarthi with us so professor parthasarthi is a professor of computer science and engineering and he is the director of the data mining research lab at ohio state university his research interests include uh, data analytics databases and high performance computing he is among a handful of researchers nationwide to have won both the department of energy and national science foundation career awards so he and his students have won multiple best paper awards or best of nominations from leading forums in the field including sdm kdd vldb www icdm wisdom and acm bioinformatics so we are excited to have you with us professor parthasarthi uh, today he will talk about uh, scaling graph representation learning algorithms in an implementation agnostic fashion so over to you professor you can start so tarun and uh, deepak and uh, all the organizers thank you for the invitation i am uh, pleased to be speaking about this topic today uh, just a bit of background um, i work at the intersection between ml and systems and so today what i hope to present to you guys is um, some ideas that we are taking you know from the systems world and how they can make the life of data scientists and machine learning engineers easier um, so uh, the uh, representation of choice for this talk is going to be about graphs they are ubiquitous both in their use and um, how they show up in na natural as well as human coupled systems um, so what i have listed here are a few examples from social biological and road networks the types of analysis performed on these types of graphs and networks are also wide and varied so on the one hand there are a series of operations that data scientists employ um, related to graph analytics and querying on these graphs so things like frequent graph mining motif retrieval click detection and subgraph querying and then there's also the other side of it where you're looking at various types of machine learning operators on graphs ranging from representation learning link prediction no classification recommendation engines and many others now given the wide variety of types of graphs as well as the types of uh, methods that people use to analyze these graphs um, um, we need to think about two broad considerations when looking at algorithms and approaches that operate on these graphs so from the productivity side of things domain users have very very different skill sets so they're diverse in terms of the programming language of choice ranging from r java to python to um, uh, matlab uh, as well as on the performance side of things when you have users or domain scientists with very different skill sets you want to understand the performance of these approaches on you know the end to end performance of the particular task the data scientist or machine learning engineer is interested in as well as you know you don't really want domain scientists to be too much worried about the underlying architectures but the fact of the matter is that at least in the systems world architectures are increasingly heterogeneous and so all of these pose challenges to support these different types of graph analysis systems so the utopian goal is can we eat our cake and have it too so can we have both high productivity and high performance through this process and so at ohio state we've been looking at um a couple of broad projects in this space the first focused on graph analytics and querying um and this is underplayed in in the fractal project and not the focus of this talk so i i give variations of this talk that focus on one or the other and in one instance i've given a talk where i've gone over a little bit of both but today given the interest in this audience i'm going to be focusing on the intersection between graph systems and ml 
And in particular, I'm going to talk about the mild and distributed mild projects that focus on graph representation learning. And at any point, if there are questions, please pose it in the chat. And I've asked Tarun and Deepak to interrupt me um, at different points in time, and I'll try to take those questions as and when um, natural intersection or interruption points arise. So um, I'm going to, in this talk, focus primarily on ML and graphs. And again, as I've already said, they arise in a wide range of applications. and you know, show up for things like node classification, where you want to classify the function of a protein, or in link prediction. Let's say you're in a website and you're trying to predict what's the next link someone's going to look at or what's the next ad they're going to click on. You might be interested in the use of network representation learning or graph representation learning for these kinds of things, because they typically have been found to result in state-of-the-art or comparable or even exceeding state-of-the-art baselines. Now, what is graph representation learning? And so in a very, very brief sense, it is a mechanism or methodology to learn vector representations of graphs. Essentially, uh, the idea is that you take a network or graph of interest and you convert it so that every node and possibly edges um, are represented by uh, a vector representation of some sort or the other. Um, the space in which this can be represented can vary, um, can operate on both measures and metrics, but ultimately the goal is once you have it in this sort of vector representation, you can use it directly for various downstream machine learning tasks such as classification, clustering, link prediction, and recommendations. Essentially, these representations can act as features in downstream ML tasks. Um, now, there are some desirable properties and, uh, of these strategies. Um, you want to make sure that the similarity between nodes in graph space um, is closely matched in whatever vector space that you realize through this representation learning mechanism. Uh, essentially, the closeness between nodes in the embedding space kind of match how close they are in terms of and how densely connected they are within the graph space. So we, we, we want this as an underlying objective for different methods. Now, there have been a plethora of methods that um, have been proposed in the literature, um, various types and mechanisms, and I'm not really going to go into all the details. This is taken from a, uh, a survey um, that was presented a couple of years ago, um, talks about you know, both unsupervised, supervised, and various different types of mechanisms uh, for representation learning. So the rest of this talk, I'm gonna primarily focus on unsupervised graph learning, but uh, we'll note that we are looking at ways in which to extend the ideas I'm going to present uh, for other types of networks and for other types of assumptions, semi-supervised as well as um, supervised. So why am I focused on this problem? Why is this problem important? So the current state is that for most graph representation learning algorithms, they simply don't scale. That's the bottom line. They are very, very expensive to learn the embeddings. And moreover, um, uh, the the, the time to learn these embeddings is also exacerbated by the need to tune parameters. Some of these representation learning algorithms have um, humongous parameter spaces. And so tuning the parameters becomes expensive as well. So that further exacerbates the challenge. So um, for example, um, some of the results I will show you uh, on a graph with a million nodes and 3 million edges. Um, existing algorithms can take hours to days, um, whereas you know what we have presented, uh, what I'm going to describe to you, can get this down on the order of minutes to a few hours. Um, and it can also scale to data sets that, at least at the time when we presented the original results, um, people had not really looked at. There has been some work since including our own that has looked at how we can 
you know, address the scaling issue even further. So our goal is, can we scale these techniques in an agnostic manner? And again, why do I care about agnostic? Because I want to make sure the user can use whatever programming environment they're used to, to prototype whatever new or uh, advanced graph representation learning algorithm they come up with, and yet be able to give them the scalability uh, through using our system. So again, going back to cutting our cake and having it too. And at this point, I also would like to ask some questions about how the scaling impacts the end quality and the end quality is measured by end-to-end -end performance on whatever machine learning algorithm they are um, working with. So that's, that's what we'd like to um, achieve here. Um, the mechanism that I'm going to describe first is MILE, which is multi-level embedding. And then we're gonna spend some time talking a little bit about a parallel version of MILE that further enhances uh, this. And it is a framework that focuses on existing unsupervised uh, graph representation learning techniques. And it doesn't matter if the graph representation learning algorithm is written in R, Python, Java, whatever, um, there's a certain interface with our framework and we just need, um, and I'll talk about that in, in a few slides. Um, and so you can, you can create your representation learning algorithm in pretty much any environment that you're comfortable with. Um, what we can show is that it not only scales the approach, but it does so without losing too much in quality. And in some cases, and there's a reason for this, I'll try to present the intuition as we move along, um, where the quality of embeddings actually improves in the process. And part of the reason is that our scaling mechanism uh, allows us to look at higher order interactions that um, you may not be, um, one, the method may not be explicitly paying attention to um, on the original graph. Um, and so I'll talk about that in a, in a few slides. So um, as concrete example, I think I've already given this before, but we can scale these approaches from um, days to hours or minutes. Um, so, all right, so let me um, present the overview of the architecture and um, then we can sort of drill down into each individual component. So the first step of our architecture is a mechanism that has been employed in the graph partitioning literature for at least two decades, uh, if not more. Um, and the idea is to leverage a coarsening refinement strategy. Now, of course, we're trying to do this for representation learning. This part is new to our work. Um, um, but as I said, these ideas have been exploited for various types of graph partitioning uh, and graph clustering algorithms in the past, including by ourselves. So the idea is you go from a much larger graph to something that's much smaller. Then the idea is you take whatever method you have developed in Python, Java, um, uh, R, C, C++, whatever uh, programming environment, you run it on this coarsest version of the graph which produces a set of embeddings, let's call them EM for the mth level graph, um, course, coarsening level. Um, and then what the next step is you refine this back so that you get embeddings on the original graph. And so this is the overall structure of the method I'm going to describe. Um, importantly, in terms of the user and why this framework permits user to do whatever they want using whatever programming environment they wish to is because the only place where the user's methods are going to be applied on is going to be on this coarsest level where the base embedding strategy is going to be looked at. And everything else, the, the benefits of scaling and things like that happen through the coarsening and refinement phase. So now let me go into um, more details. Um, so, as I said, there are three phases, graph coarsening, embedding, and refinement. We're going to start with graph coarsening. Um, 
so what are we looking at in this case? What we want to do is to reduce the number of nodes and edges in the graph repeatedly through some structured process. Um, and while retaining or keeping in mind our end objective of making sure that whatever embedding we're coming up with, um, if something is close in the graph space, it is also close in the embedded space. So we need to consider that underlying element in how we do the coarsening. Um, these graphs form a very natural hierarchy where G0 can be considered at the top of the graph while GM is the most coarsest version at the bottom of the hierarchy. So just like the diagram I showed you in the previous slide. So um, what criteria should we use? As I said, we want to keep our underlying assumption or criterion or objective in mind. So we really want to be able to merge structurally similar nodes as their embeddings are likely to be similar. So structurally similar nodes are close and they're going to be close in embedding space. So we'd like to use that mechanism to create the coarsening architecture. So let me give you um, an example through this animation. So the idea is that if two vertices U and V are structurally equivalent, then we'd like to match and essentially coarsen uh, those two vertices into a super node and then update uh, information that lists that sits on the edges. And again, maybe initially we are focused on this could work. This, this I, the ideas I'm going to present will work equally well for both weighted and unweighted graphs. Um, but let's assume we start with a graph that's unweighted or a graph equivalently that could be thought of where all edges have a weight of one. So we merge um, D and E because they are structurally similar and both have an incident edge on A. And the only change we've made here is that the weight of the edge now represents two because we've merged those two edges. And uh, the, I've also denoted um, the, um, the course and node representation as node representation DE. So structural equivalent matching is basically trying to take nodes that are similar in structure, that have structural similarity that are close by and the, so that they can be grouped together. So that's one element that we can leverage. Another element that people in the literature have proposed is to use something called heavy edge matching, where the idea is to pick an unmatched node, U, and select the heaviest edge incident on it, say UV. So for example, in this example, um, uh, in the first example, in the first side, left-hand side, all the edges are equally weighted, but on the graph on the right, you do see some edges having value greater than one. And so heavy edges, um, we're talking about the weights of the edges. And then the idea is to match U with V if V is also unmatched, assuming that the heavy edge, edge incident on U is the one between U and V. Um, we made a slight modification to this approach that has been used in the graph partitioning literature. Um, and our ideas are drawing some inspiration from some smoothening tactics that the machine learning community is obviously aware of. But the idea is to normalize some of these things based on the de degree of the nodes um, incident on that particular edge. And so you take into account both the degree of U and the degree of V and account for that in some sort of weighted fashion. So why is something like this important? So let's look at this example that we have here. So if you ignore the edge of A to DE here, you could potentially course in AB, AC, or BC. Now, if you apply the normalization that I described, you would have the following weights and you would select the weight that was the largest, which is going to be BC under the normalized. Without normalization, node B and node A could have gotten matched, which may not be exactly what you, what you really wanted here. So under this approach of using structural equivalence matching with normalized heavy edge matching, we can get, we move from the graph on the left to the graph on the right. 
Now, um, there's a couple of things that are going to be important notationally for us to consider. So the original graph, the one on the left, is um, listed using its adjacency matrix, A0. Um, M01 is the matching matrix that uh, keeps track of going from the graph on the left to the graph on the right. And so what you see here is um, the columns represent the graph on the right, the rows represent the graph on the left, and you basically have a one in an entry if a particular node has been merged and zero in the entry if the node has not um, uh, zero, so a one in this entry, so in this graph here says that A corresponds to A in the original graph. BC has two ones here corresponding to nodes B and C in the original graph, and D and E have two ones here corresponding to nodes D and E in the original graph. Now, um, what's easy to show is that with some basic linear algebra described in this equation over here, I can get the adjacency matrix of the representation of this graph over here using um, a transpose operation and two matrix multiplications. And you're going to get the same result as it corresponds to this. So the only thing that you have to keep in mind here is that there is this concept of a matching matrix, which tells you how things are being coarsened. And so when you have to undo this coarsening during the refinement phase, we're going to be using these matrices um, as we move along. And importantly, all of these are, um, you can do with simple linear algebraic operations. So now we have finished the coarsening. Um, uh, and now you have the coarsest graph. Uh, the number of levels you go to is a user specified parameter. Um, but, uh, and this is something that can be iterated on. But once you've reached this sort of base embedding, now is where the user can use whatever code base they have in whatever programming environment they built it in and apply it on this course and graph. So on the course and graph, you can generate node embeddings using existing techniques, whatever those techniques are, sequential, parallel, implemented in any uh, programming language. There's no restriction on the type of embedding technique that can be used for generating these embeddings or the type of programming environment. So users have the opportunity to be highly productive. They can prototype this in whatever system they are most comfortable doing. So now, why is this, um, why is this beneficial? So first of all, as you coarsen the graph down, it goes from sitting outside out of core to fitting in memory, to fitting in L2 cache, to fitting in L1 cache. So this coarsest thing can be fit in um, as close to the processor as possible. So you have very high locality. Uh, and due to its small size, whatever embedding strategy that you are proposing can execute much faster because it is everything is sitting in cache, uh, in possibly in L1 cache. The other advantage you have at this point is that if you had applied the embedding strategy on the original graph, um, you are unable to, to get, you know, take advantage of some of the higher order interactions that these methods can provide. Um, through this coarsening process, some of those higher order mechanisms, higher order interactions can be bridged because through the coarsening process, you're bringing the graph down where you can reach other nodes more easily if, for example, your representation learning relies on random walks or similar types of matrix operations. So um, the embedding strategy is applied, whatever uh, programming environment the users have created that in. And then now is the next step. And this um, is perhaps the most, you know, um, interesting step for um, the, both when we were developing, this was the most innovative and interesting step. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, the idea here. So we're focusing now on refinement and refinement is the process of going from this coarsest version back to the original version while realizing the embeddings. So our goal is given a set of coarsened graphs, G0, G1, G2, all the way to GM, and their corresponding matching matrices, as I've described, 
and the node embedding, the base node embedding on the coarsest version, our problem is to generate the embedding of the original graph G0 from this input. Okay, so that's what we need to do. All right, so one strategy, a simple solution is to project embeddings from current graph to the graph above it in the hierarchy and iterate through this process. So this would end up with something like what I'm showing you here, where you compute the embedding representation for the coarsest nodes, DE, BC, and A, um, shown in dark blue, um, light blue, and green. And then, um, as you refine this graph back up a level, you share those representations to the nodes that were matched in order to create the course and representation. So this, of course, is something simple and easy to do, and it's a projection on this new uh, graph GM minus one. Now, of course, the downside with this and the problems which I'm sure several of you have already observed is that all match nodes will have the same embedding. And this may not work very well for your downstream tasks if you have too many nodes with exactly the same embedding. There is no separability. It doesn't have the separability constraint, which I did not talk about initially, but, uh, but is important for a lot of you know, downstream tasks. You want to keep you know, things in the graph space if they're close to be close in the in this space, but also things that are different, you want to keep them, you know, you, you want separability. So um, both of those objectives are important. And the simple solution is not going to be able to address that. Now we have another option, and this is what we ended up using, which is to perform this embedding refinement using a graph convolution network model. Um, and so just to give you a very high level picture of what we are doing here, um, we have the embeddings at the um, uh, courses level, level M, um, and that is denoted as eta M. Um, and from that level M, we can do an initial projection um, on the graph represented by level M minus one. So basically you can apply, you can multiply the matching, the matching matrix, the corresponding matching matrix with the embeddings, which will share it with all the course and levels as, I, as the simple solution were to suggest. So as the solution here um, suggested, we could do something like that to get the projected projection layer that I'm showing you here in purple. And then what we do is we take a series of graph convolution layers, um, L, let's, you know, without loss of generality, L layers, where each layer, so say layer K, can be represented using this ReLU function with this with a set of matrix operators. So what we're looking at here with respect to DM minus one, AM minus one, and DM minus one over here is simply um, the normalized Laplace, which also is quite nicely connected to what we described when we talked about normalized heavy edge matching. In fact, there is a striking similarity there and that actually helps us um, internally. Um, and then um, again, uh, the powers here are uh, for the degree matrices, dm minus one. Um, and whatever the output from the previous layer was, plus a d by d matrix, which corresponds to the parameters for that particular layer. So that's the convolution layers that we're going to use. And the output of this is going to be the um, predicted embeddings um, for graph GM minus one. So we have a approach to go from the embeddings on graph GM to the embeddings on graph GM minus one through this graph convolution network model. We're not quite done yet. We need to think about the loss function. So the, the one option for the loss function, the natural option, is to see how far away the output, the predicted output, is from the ground truth output. And so if you have ground truth embeddings for GM minus one, we can design a loss function um, that takes into, so takes 
into account the ground truth and how far away the predicted is from the ground truth. Um, now, there are two problems with this approach, with this loss function approach. The first is that we need ground truth embeddings on two versions of the graph, uh, the coarsest version and the last but one coarsest version. And this is expensive. And our goal, let's not forget, is to scale these things as efficiently as possible. The other sort of more nuanced issue is that the embedding spaces that you're looking at in both of these, if you're treating them independent of each other, they are orthogonal transformations of one another. You may not be operating in exactly the same space. Now, there have been some fixes proposed in the literature, and we can certainly take advantage of those, but that could be expensive as well. So our approach is to change the loss function and essentially learn these parameters, the theta k parameters that we're using in this graph convolution network through the, the loss function defined here. So what we are changing is um, rather than focusing on how far we are from predicted to actual in the um, um, last but one courses layer, let's focus on the last layer itself and let's use a uh, let's use this gcn architecture to learn these theta k parameters and then we can iterate through each of the steps in turn so it has the advantage that you're operating in the same space it also has the advantage that you do not have to compute base embeddings for two ver two representations of the graphs two core two course representations of the graphs so you're saving on the the expense cost, and it simplifies things for you. And then once you've learned these parameters for this GCN, then you can use those learned parameters as we move up, iterate through. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about what I mean by iterate through. So as we showed you in this GCN over here, we're going to use this formulation for um, embedding of graph GM minus one, would be based on the embeddings, uh, the, the projected embeddings of M minus one, that was the purple layer, um, with the adjacency matrix of the graph that we're focused on in M minus one. And that is what we are going to use to predict the embeddings for, um, 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 that, that is what we are going to use to generate the final embeddings for layer M minus one. And then we're going to do the same thing again, um, iteratively replacing M and M minus one with M minus one and M minus two all the way until we get to G zero. Keep applying this iteratively until you get to the embeddings for graph G zero. That's at, uh, in a nutshell, the core idea. And so we're basically going to apply this GCN model iteratively for each layer as we move up, um, as we refine the embeddings. And so that describes an overview of the architecture um, and maybe a good point to see if there are any questions. So um, uh, if there have been any questions, I'm happy to take them right now. Um, and then I will talk about results and then we'll get to distributed mile after that. So Tarun, are there any questions? Has anyone at this point, or I can continue. Uh, you, you can continue, Professor Patasarthi. Uh, I can't okay. see any questions right now. Okay, sounds okay. good. All right, thank you. So um, th this is an overview of the architecture. Um, um, now let's go into some of the results that we have. Um, and so what I'm going to show you in the next few slides are results on some data sets. We're going to show results on downstream tasks, such as node classification, as well as link prediction. We're going to look at quality as well as scalability. Quality for um, is going to be using whatever quality metrics are common in link prediction and, and node classification. Uh, and um, we're going to look at a range of different techniques for which mile is applied, um, drawn from uh, random walk techniques, factorization approaches, as well as optimization-based approaches, such as uh, the line algorithm. So what I'm showing you here 
is focused on node classification. Um, and um, what you see here on the y-axis um, for the graph on the left is quality, micro F1 scores. What you see on the right is time. Um, and this one um, is in minutes. Um, this is on a data set, uh, a popular data set, YouTube data set. And what, I'm, what we see here is that, um, for example, for um, uh, the mile representations of, of deep walk, um, node to vec, line, netmf, graph, brarap, and mile SDNE. Um, what you see here is that the node classification performance um, is relatively consistent across each of these uh, examples. Um, and so, um, but importantly, um, for all of them, um, we do see um, um, uh, an improvement in time as you go down to coarser levels. So as you increase the coarsening level, all of them do drop uh, in terms of, um, in a significantly drop in terms of time, but in terms of quality, they're fairly consistent. So level zero basically means the original approach on the full graph. You are seeing a qualitative improvement, at least initially for most of these. Uh, and that qualitative improvement, as I said, is um, uh, we've, um, we've studied these carefully is because of some of the higher order interactions that we're able to model through the coarsening approach. But eventually, you know, at the end of the day, what we're doing is an approximation. So at some point, these start dipping down, and but not by much. And so you are still going to get, for example, moving from something that takes over a thousand plus minutes to something that takes, um, you know, uh, a few minutes. Um, and so uh, it, it, you are seeing a dramatic improvement in speed with not too much loss in quality. Moving to another larger, an even larger data set, the results are very similar. Quality is consistent, but you see very, very dramatic improvement in speeds going from you know, several days to the order of an hour or less for depending on the uh, coarsening level you go to. So we're getting this the desired speed up as expected. The results on link prediction are very similar. There is a different measure of qualitative performance, but again, the quality is relatively consistent and you're seeing a consistent improvement in terms of the scalability. I should note here that the time graphs are all in log scale. So small changes here are actually represent quite dramatic improvements in time costs. Um, we see a similar thing with memory consumption. As I said, when we go, the coarsening process by design reduces you know, the size of the graph that we need to operate on, and therefore the memory consumption is reduced. Um, and this does have implications for low level architectural designs and things like that, but I'm going to skip some of those thoughts for now. Now, um, thus far, I've talked about um, ideas um, to improve the speed up of these representation learning algorithms on a single node. So one thing that we've done is we've recently extended this for you know, a parallel architecture across a cluster of nodes or a cluster of GPUs. So the, um, what I'm going to quickly go through in the next few slides is simply talk about what kinds of you know, parallelism tricks that we used for speeding up the coarsening and refinement phase. We left the embedding phase completely alone because our goal still is to retain the productivity angle of mild in terms of the um, fact that users can deploy and evaluate their methods on whatever programming environment they are most comfortable working with. So we didn't touch the embedding, the base embedding phase, but we do have parallel versions for both coarsening and refinement. And I'm going to talk about those in the next few slides. The core idea that we leveraged for 
um, coarsening, the core ideas actually, is that we leverage locality sensitive hashing for finding the matches. Now, this has been an idea that has been exploited in finding dense subgraphs, has been exploited in various types of sparsification algorithms as well. Um, and it turns out to be naturally parallel um, and very effective in reducing time across parallel computational threads. Um, and for the normalized HEM part of the coarsening, um, there was a little bit more of a challenge here because the original approach relies on you know, sequential execution. Um, the version that we ended up using find to work very well here is an idea of unprotected matching by LaSalle and Carapace. The problem with this method is that there could be matching conflicts. You could have multiple nodes being matched to multiple other nodes and you need to resolve these conflicts. Um, but it turns out that using this and then resolving whatever conflicts arise through post-processing ended up working quite well for us. Now there was the option of um, both a distributed variation of this coarsening step or a shared memory step, shared memory approach. We evaluated both, as you can see um, from these timing results on a particular graph, uh, the shared memory approach had a significant advantage over the distributed memory approach. This is not surprising in its own right, um, but it is relevant because um, uh, it, it turns out that for coarsening, there's not enough work for it to make sense to take advantage of distributed memory algorithms. And so basically, uh, it's basically a function of how much work is involved in the coarsening step. Turns out that for refinement, on the other hand, um, there is a benefit to using a distributed approach, and we did end up leveraging that. So again, the embedding step we left alone, we want it to be generalizable to any embedding method implemented in any uh, uh, programming environment and compatible with multi-CPU and GPU training. If you have a parallel graph representation learning algorithm, by all means, you can use it in this setup. Um, the refinement stage ended up using, we ended up using this infrastructure from Uber called Horovod, set it up as a distributed memory, um, you know, a cluster setup uh, across multiple GPUs. Uh, there are a couple of differences, you know, in terms of what we do in distributed mild versus mild. Mild samples nodes sequentially. Here we do parallel sampling. Uh, mild trains on all nodes. And here we relied, at least in the parallel version, on mini batch training. So there was a localized element to this. But it turns out that in terms of quality, this did not impact performance too much. So again, we looked at a similar set of data sets. Um, we showed results using micro F1 on node classification, similar results for link prediction. Uh, the hardware in the distributed environment was in the, we had four machines each with one NVIDIA Tesla GPU and 128 GB of RAM. Um, and again, the, the bottom line is that between mile and distributed mile, very comparable in terms of quality for different methods. Um, but distributed mile, again, offered a pretty significant end-to-end speedup. And this in spite of the fact that the embedding strategy is inherently sequential. So Amdahl's law tells you that you're limited by your slowest uh, component and the slowest component for most of these was the base embedding. Um, now we drill down on this even further. So again, these results are similar to what we showed earlier. We drill down on this um, even further and the shared memory set up for um, um, coarsening offered up to a 10x speed up. And with refinement, we were seeing up to a close to a 60x speed up compared to um, the sequential version of mile. So again, bottom line, this helps improve performance. But the key thing is the user, the person who is developing the new representation learning method 
does not have to worry about any of these. You get all of these for free. You just need to run that method that you've developed in whatever programming environment on the base embedding on the coarsest version of the graph. And you get all of these improvements in speed essentially for free. So what are the takeaways from this talk? So we talked about the, the utopian goal of high performance and high productivity. Um, we talked about um, uh, an approach specifically focused on graph representation learning, unsupervised graph representation learning called MILE. Um, and the reason for its existence is that um, these embedding techniques Techniques often do not scale to large graphs. MILE is a framework. It scales existing techniques in an agnostic manner and improves the quality of generated embeddings in the process up to a point. Um, it is um, also can be improved through a distributed multi-level version of the framework. Um, and the distributed training paradigm gives you additional improvements with fairly high scaling efficiencies on the coarsening and refinement stretch. And again, overall improved scalability with comparable quality. So that in a nutshell is my talk. I have some references at the end. Um, and I wanted to again, thank uh, Albert Liang, who's at Google Brain. He was a student who worked on this. Uh, before he graduated, and Saket Gurukar, who is on the market this year. Um, and that is all I have today. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing so I can look at the chat and answer any questions. Um, so I do see a question here, so I'll start with that, and then others feel free to pose additional questions. So, um, so the question is, how sensitive is the embedding quality to the coarsening methods? So the rules for matching nodes. So this is an excellent question. We, we designed the coarsening strategy to be um, mindful of our consideration of nodes that are close to each other in graph space remain close to each other in embedding space. And so, when, when I say we're mindful of this, we're looking at not just their structural similarity, but also whether they have a lot of common neighbors and, and so on and so forth. And as it turns out, this is kind of critical to make sure that the uh, embedding quality by and large is retained. We did run an ablation study where we looked at alternative approaches other than the approaches that I've presented. And as you can expect, the robustness of those methods were not great when you use some kind of random matching and things like that. So the, so the approach that we described using both structural equivalent matching, as well as normalized uh, heavy edge matching uh, was carefully constructed to take into account the intent of your question. So it's an excellent question, but um, we are, uh, we are trying to make sure that we've designed it with this sort of idea in mind that things in, that are similar in graph space remain similar in embedding space and things that are, um, you know, there, but yet there is the ability to discriminate amongst things that are different in graph space that are different in the embedding space. So great question. Um, any other questions? 